my second question is, is yesterday someone, and I was trying to look through my notes, I can't remember who said that baclofen can inhibit someone's rehabilitation, so I've got... Um, uh, it was her, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I've got a, so I've got a son, and, and really, I mean, if I sum everything up that I've heard here, um, the best thing for me to do is rehab work, right, and wait for some, some breakthroughs. So that's what we're doing. And so why is he on a drug that could inhibit that if there are any other options? I, I, I know it was Janet, and I'm going to blame it was Janet. Janet. <laughs> <laughs> it's because I felt obligated to say it. <laughs> and uh, I was actually wondering why there was not a big firework of questions after that in regards to that. Because so when, when, when we talked about activity-based therapies yesterday, right? so our goal is to increase activity in the nervous system to help, it, uh, help its repair. In any drug that, that works on spasticity, so maybe baclofen, xanaflex, uh, Valium, they all decrease activity. So you would think that, uh, at least theoretically, you, in, you inhibit regeneration. And so we had taken this into the laboratory, this idea, and tested it in, in, in animals, but we, and we used uh, baclofen. And we could basically show that there was an inhibition of, 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 of cell regeneration, at least in a dish, or in, in, the, in, in the animal. Um, we have not been able to look at that same mechanism in other drugs like Xanaflex, uh, I mean, um, uh, Valium, or Dantrolene. Um, personally, I think this is probably a, a class effect, so I don't think this is just specific to baclofen. And, uh, and so it doesn't, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that I don't use baclofen in my clinic, um, because if your spasticity interferes with your quality of life, uh, causes you pain, uh, it causes uh, contractures, uh, um, make, you can't sleep, you know, if, it if it interferes in any way even with the rehabilitation, we use it. The, the important part to note on this is if we have to use it, we use it at the lowest possible dose. So we not generally blanket everybody who has had a cord injury uh, with, with baclofen. And if we, if we really need to, just take the lowest possible dose. So. So, you know, one thing, just to follow up on the previous uh, question as well, that, you know, you're hearing people who do this all the time and very bright people. So let me, let me simplify it down. It's not, you know, when your question is about plasmapheresis and when we use it and, you know, we don't know how it works. It's that we don't know specifically how it works, but there are basically three main processes. One is the inflammation originally. And if there's ongoing inflammation, the plasmapheresis works at sort of helping to decrease the inflammation. The second thing is helping to protect the nerves that have been injured, and that's the neuroprotective side. And there's a lot of work, but, but by the way, when I say a lot of work, nothing that is now available that we can say, this has been tried and tested, and this is very neuroprotective. Again, in my talk, I sort of talked about some of the evidence that people are using SSRIs, antidepressants, and lithium as potentially a neuroprotective agent, but this is being tested now. But the first thing is stop the inflammation, and if the inflammation is ongoing, you still need to stop it because that will cause injury. Then once the injury happens, protect the nerves, and then the third step is what uh, Dr. Levy gave us a wonderful overview of today, which is now try to help restore function. So just to sort of to make it, does that clarify a little bit? If there's ongoing inflammation, stop the inflammation, then the next step is try to preserve the neurons, and the third thing is try to restore function. No, I'm clear. I'm just, you okay. know, I'm a little sensitive to the fact that I, I think that sometimes hospitals will not, will look at um, procedures and dollars and perceived risk, and so they mix all these things into the equation, and all I'm carried about, all I care about is getting my son back. Absolutely. So I'm just, I want to make sure that I'm not somehow missing something because of all this other stuff that happens behind the scenes. That's all. And I'd say, again, what, what really impresses me, and I was just here talking ahead of time uh, about the Kennedy-Krieger model, is, is that we should all have the Kennedy-Krieger model, which is, you know, they were talking about how at, you know, at the end of the week they will get together and all of the doctors will talk together um, uh, the physiatrists and the psychologists and, you know, the rehab, uh, OT, PT, uh, sort of the group. And so, again, ideally you want to try to find a quarterback who can sort of quarterback it and make sure it's not just, oh, gee, we can help. 
with the pain and spasticity and forget the fact that you need to minimize and balance. It is a balancing act and, and you really do want a team that will say, but we want to make sure he's not so weak he can't move. So trying to get that team together is so critical. And, uh, if I go back to your second question all the time, because I think I heard a big concern that you had this uh, should my son be on a potentially dangerous drug? And, and so I want to take away this fear because, because the data we have is just in animals and in dishes. And uh, we have not been able to demonstrate this anywhere in, uh, in, in, in our patients. And so you shouldn't just go home now and say, well, my, my son is on this potentially dangerous drug that might not make him walk again. That's not true. Um, just be, be aware of that we're trying to, if we use it, we use it at very low levels. And uh, even other drugs might r potentially work similarly. I, okay. I do also want to point out about baclofen. Baclofen's been used for mm -hmm. literally decades in a much more huge population, the cerebral palsy population, which also has spasticity. And there's this, as Daniel referred to, there's this balancing act of trying to make sure your son's not sedated, make sure there's not pain. But also, but also, and I want Daniel to comment on this, um, in cerebral palsy, we actually try to titrate it to uh, improve, Im try to improve mobility, i.e. modulate the tone enough to actually increase the child's mobility or ability to respond to physical therapy or, wh or whatever. Daniel, you want to... You want to just comment about that in terms of the mobility part, because I, I, I'm uh, speaking a little bit out of turn. Well, so this is what I want to say, and we use it if if you can't do rehabilitation because you're stiff and, and spastic. I mean, then you can't get any benefit of, of any kind of uh, activity-based therapist that we're, that we're trying to do. So you kind of take away some of the spasticity, so, we, so you will be able to maximize your participants in these programs to actually maximize your benefit. I think that's where you're trying to go. Right yeah, that's what, yeah. I, that's what I wanted to refer to. I, I, also, um, I would also like to chime in, too, as, as a nurse um, at a large university. I think Maureen's talk yesterday was uh, really applicable. It sounds intuitive, but if you look at um, the role of the nurse and the social worker and other ancillary support, I know sometimes with our patients, there's been a lot of discussion about do you stay local and go to the, cl the closest ER or hospital, or do you drive a significant distance to get into a university hospital? And I know as nurses, we'll sometimes sit down and say, we either think it would be beneficial for the patient to stay local, because it would be a huge stressor for the patient to try to find daycare for their kids or somebody to watch them. They have to take a huge transportation effort to get to our center. Um, and sometimes that may be more of a stressor on the family as a unit than the actual benefit of uh, having them drive in. On the other hand, though, I think some patients need more of that nurturing that's coming from the primary university center, and it would benefit them to take a large journey to a large university to get more one-on-one -on -one interaction and build trust and confidence in that whole entire healthcare team. And so I kind of feel like looking at the th three or four reasons for plasma exchange or um, an infusion therapy that could maybe done be done locally. There's there's that X factor. Maybe we could call it the Maureen factor. You know that there's that added level of having like a liaison or a representative to know everything about the patient and their family and what works best for them for that long term benefit. Okay. <clears throat> Next question here in the the corner. Hi, I'm from Australia. So situations over there are a, a little bit different. But I just, in general, in as far as physicians that you run into in an emergency centre where you, when you go, when things go <coughs> wrong, is it reasonable to expect any physician that you would see in that situation to recognise just generally that it's a neurological condition? If you present with tingling and numbness and inability to stand, present with pain, um, well, in, as in my case, in a band that came around here, um, visible sort of shaking and muscle spasms. Is it reasonable that in most instances someone should stick their hand up and say, we need to consult a neurologist? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Wanda, you want to chime in on that one? <laughs> well, I'll tell you, if you go in and you say that the pain is right up here, then they're going to look at your heart first. And if you say the pain is down here, they're going to look at your belly first. They're going to look at anything that's going to kill you first. 
And then hopefully within the hour they should realize that it is a neurological condition. Well, I mean, I had a physician in there who I believe he was very genuine, very caring, and he, he believed there was something wrong. Unfortunately, in the Australian system, if you go through a private hospital, which we did because we had private insurance, um, in order to be admitted to the hospital, you have to be admitted by a specialist. So it being a Saturday, he had to contact someone. And unfortunately, there are more surgeons around than there are any other specialists on the weekend. And um, if I sort of hadn't yelled loud enough and long enough, I would have had my gallbladder removed and been placed in a psychiatric unit. <laughs> if it wasn't for the fact that about eight days later, someone finally decided that as I still had a catheter in because I was unable to um, function, my bladder was, had no, no function, someone, well a nurse actually, kept saying you must ask to see a urologist. Just keep telling the doctor you want to see a, a urologist. And I did. Um, and a urologist came in and spoke to me and took a look at all the notes and all the tests that had been done to date. And then he sat down next to the bed and he said, well dear, how long have you had MS? And I know the two specialists standing at the end of the bed, which was a surgeon and a specialist physician, and I, we all just looked at him. And I said, well, I don't, never. I mean, I've never had. He said, oh no, you've definitely got an advanced case of MS. <laughs> and um, from that, I did eventually get referred to a neurologist. But is that really an unusual situation to happen? Well, so let me ask this question just from the panel. Uh, on average in the United States, medical schools, four years, uh, clinic time is somewhere between uh, two and two and a half years, so 24 to 30 months of medical school. Uh, how much time on average does a medical student spend rotating on neurology out of the 24 months uh, in the United States? What's the average rotation schedule for a medical student? It is, it is very minimal. I'll say. Um, it's usually it's usually about four weeks. Four weeks. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. Four weeks. So in four weeks, they've got to get stroke, seizures. They've got to get peripheral nerve, central nervous system. And so in terms of the list of things that they're going to see in their life, the rare diseases. So uh, what? 99.9% .9 of medical students graduate medical school probably without seeing TM or NMO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just, just by the numbers. Mm -hmm. And so um, your, your point's a valid one in terms of uh, if we're not getting it in medical school, uh, how do we improve the care at the front lines? Internal medicine, ob -GYN, ER, pediatrics, those are probably the top four. And really it's, it's through uh, public education campaigns. And I would actually argue it's through you guys as well, having conversations with your physicians, making them aware. So I work uh, with practices in the area, and what's interesting, and uh, we were talking about the other day, I had a call about a patient who had tested positive for NMO, and they came down, and four weeks later, get a call, you'll never believe this, we have another one. You know, the same thing. And the moment the practices start looking, things go much better. And so you guys are some of our best ambassadors for trying to improve that. Unfortunately, it takes this kind of effort, and I'm not sure it's going to change on the medical school side. I don't know if anyone has a different thought. But. Um, just as a, an adjunct to that, my son's actually studying in his third year of medicine in, in Australia, and he's just finished his first neurology ro rotation, of which there was four weeks, and um, the th first three weeks were in a stroke unit, and the fourth week was a generalised sort of overview of neurology, you know, your starting point of neurology, I suppose, if you like. And so I asked him, you know, what was actually covered in that, and he said, oh, he was really lucky. He had this rather weird guy with white hair and a long white beard who came in and he thought, oh, great, he's going to be really fun for shoots. But he, he said, he spoke really well and, and related to us really well, and he covered an awful lot of stuff, Mum. And compared to the other group who'd had a different tutor, but he said he was really listening out at that stage to see whether then they were being given an idea of the sort of really basic neurological things that you might see. I, 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 don't, I don't know the, whether there's a sort of a vague range of symptoms that should flag someone that it's neurological, but um, he said that's not taught. And so he asked the question and said, well, how do we know that if someone does come in with this and this, it's a bit strange, why doesn't somebody sort of say, 
you know, at that point, I mean, he asked the question only because of he's well aware of my situation, which is a bit of an unusual scenario. And this professor sat back and came back to him the next day and he said it was a jolly good point and he'd like to take it further. I mean, I can only hope with better education. Australia's a long way away and we've only just established um, a proper um, association with the TMA. Up until recently, we had members of the TMA, just of the Australian community, but we didn't um, have a, a formal association. But now the Spinal Injuries Association of Australia has in some way made some sort of binding legal agreement to represent the TMA over there and hopefully get some sort of small budget. And after attending a meeting in May, which Sandy and Dr Greenberg um, addressed at, one of the th and from speaking to other people that I got to know at that meeting, one of the th things we all agree is we just want to raise awareness, particularly in emergency departments in hospitals, so that then hopefully once that's done, the next step will happen that they'll see a neurologist. We can't change the fact that neurologists don't have, in many cases, a lot of experience with TM, NMO or ADEM or whatever, but at least if we can get those flags going up. So if anyone has any great suggestions as to how best we can spend probably a fairly small budget just to help put that red, red flag out there, I'd love to hear. I have one suggestion actually. I think if you can convince emergency rooms to put in an MRI machine and make it easily available for the ER docs and they can run a patient through an MRI machine, I think it would make the diagnosis a lot more uh, common. And I'll make a much more uh, uh, practical suggestion as well, um, which is something I sort of uh, said to uh, one of the neurology student course directors and who was going to the national meeting and I said, make sure that on your list, uh, as you discuss spinal cord disease, and there is a list of what is discussed and for medical students to make sure that rare de these rare syndromes, demyelinating syndromes are discussed as well, as well. Um, because if every medical student going through neurology um, does see, you know, TN, NMO as part, as part of their uh, little section that they get on spinal cord disease, uh, it raises awareness among all doctors who future in the future who are graduating in your country. So, uh, Doug, I have a question for you, and I apologize because I realize that this is predominantly for our uh, patients and families, but I have a, a burning question before I hit the road. And we've heard a lot about the treatment of acute disease and symptomatic therapies, but as Michael Levy pointed out, somewhat diplomatically, I've been working in this in a long time, <laughs> and I, I remain absolutely convinced that transverse myelitis is a prime target for cellular therapies, a certain subset of patients. Um, what I'm not hearing now is, is a drive amongst you to really push this towards the clinic. If, and I know, Doug, you've been working on this for a long time, and I know you're trying to, or part of the goal is to try to select patients that, that could be amenable to this kind of therapies. But I'd like to hear a bit more about this, because you know, if Jaron can do this in acute spinal cord injury, fixed lesions, identifiable lesions in the middle of the thoracic spinal cord of people who've had the disease for some time, whatever time you choose to do it, should be, in my view, in my, I think, fairly learned view and the, the view of the literature of years and years of experience, should be a number one target. I mean, our goal is MS, as you know, but I, I keep being put off by people saying, well, it should be transverse myelitis. So this is the audience, and I, I suggest this is what you really need to be doing. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right, and uh, I think there, there is a push, and I think there is a recognition that uh, transverse myelitis is really potentially the ideal disorder in which to test the hypothesis that you can repair the nervous system, <laughs> optic neuritis being the other, probably equally good in some senses. Um, and so there are companies that are moving forward with this and, um, uh, and are very interested in, in transplanting directly into the spinal cord of patients with, with transverse myelitis and optic neuritis. And Ben, you're looking at optic neuritis as an indication, right? We've been, we've been talking about it. And so I, th I think it will happen. I think it will happen fairly soon. I mean, uh, pharmaceutical companies have not really embraced uh, stem cells for a variety of reasons at this point. Um, 
And so it's been left to kind of small companies and, you know, Giron has been one of few, but, but there hasn't been this groundswell of pharmaceutical interest in, in stem cells. But I, I think it is coming. And, uh, and I think you're going to see trials in transverse myelitis and optic neuritis pretty soon. And part of it is because the readouts to allow us to know whether we have initiated repair are getting better and better. You know, electrophysiologic readouts, imaging readouts, and clinical readouts would convince us that we're on the right track or not fairly quickly. So I, I think it will come. Yeah, it's a tough target. So part of this is, and it, it brings up a uh, somewhat of a philosophical question, because one, so there, there's two issues. There's the clinical issue and there's the science issue. On the science side, as we move to clinical trials of stem cell therapy, one of the things we want, we desperately want to be able to prove is that it works. Because I have a personal belief that if the first series of stem cell trials that are out there are utter failures clinically, we are setting the field back from a, and this is a political comment, this is, this is a, a philosophical comment, and you can take it for what it is. And so, personally, I really want to see the first trials succeed. I, I want to see them do well. And one of the issues is judging success. So transverse myelitis, I think, is an ideal, I, I think you're right, I think it's an, an ideal target. I think we would want a group of patients who, where we could try and prove that there was intact, ax, relatively intact axons, but with loss of myelin, and I think that's the ideal situation as a first foray into a thoracic cord lesion. The nice thing about the optic nerve is uh, the measurement of success is reproducible, objective, and doesn't vary patient to patient. I can follow vision, I can follow optical coherence tomography, I can follow visual book potentials, and I can say, based on my therapy, is somebody getting better or not? Some transverse myelitis patients have weakness, some have numbness, some have bladder issues. We would need, uh, in judging success, uh, larger ends, a larger population, to deal with the heterogeneity of the patient population. Whereas in optic neuritis, it's a very homogeneous population. And so that's the reason optic neuritis is on the list. It, it's a, it is a very, it's a very hard target, and that's one of the things we're working on the lab in terms of access and delivery into the optic nerve, because I think, I think that is the major challenge. I think you're right. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, I think we're in the corner back there first. Hi. I'm uh, Nancy Miller. I'm from Los Angeles, California, better known to Sandy and Dr. Greenberg as Walter's mom. <laughs> um, when coming here, my vision was exactly this, get all these doctors and the professionals to answer my question, but pretty much all of them have been answered. But I have a question. Does all this treatment and everything apply to the same, to ADEM, as it does to, I uh, heard a lot of talk about uh, TM and uh, NMO and treatments for that. And if uh, <laughs> steroids wasn't given right away until five days later, or uh, that chemo drug cycle hasn't been given. Can it be given later? Or the damage is done and that's, there's not much to be done depending where the lesion is. So that's my we, question to someone who might know. I think for ADEM, we pretty much follow the same protocol. You, you wanna come in quickly, you wanna get your steroids. If the steroids don't help in a day or two, get ready for plasma exchange uh, and more if needed. Um, but once you're beyond a certain point where there's no really good evidence for inflammation anymore by MRI or by spinal fluid analysis, then I think those kind of treatments aren't going to be as helpful anymore, that the lesion has burnt out and that maybe um, if you'd had, it, you know, earlier treatment would probably prevent more damage. We don't have good evidence for that in ADEM, but I think there's good evidence for that in other diseases and that... That is our goal. If you have ADEM, come in, come in quickly and get treated quickly. 
How do you know if you have Adam? That's a good question. Sometimes you know you come in and it's on the list among neuromyelitis optica and transverse myelitis, and sometimes it just takes time for us to realize what it is uh, down the line to see how you respond to certain medications, see if there's a relapse in the future. Sometimes it takes us a few years to look back and say, yep, that was ADEM. If we get a biopsy, that's a different story. We can see it on a, on a, on a biopsy, but we don't always put our patients through a brain, a brain biopsy for ADEM. Oh, I didn't know there was a biopsy for ADEM. But if and they've come in and diagnosed as meningitis from the beginning and took five to eight days, then in the seventh day, eight day goes into a coma, is it like, then they found out, you know, I think this is Adam after seeing 14 doctors and moved up three floors. That, that is unfortunately the, a common scenario. Meningitis being much more common than ADEM, it's obviously at the top of their minds. Um, we see a lot of both, so, you know, uh, maybe at a place like Hopkins, it would happen a lot quicker, but certainly almost every patient coming in with ADEM is being treated for meningitis until we know for sure what's going on. You don't want to miss meningitis either, but hopefully you want to get to ADEM quicker than seven, eight days. And if the lesion is in a position like the pons where his is, does that really, it really makes a big difference? Position, areas of, the, of inflammation make a big difference. Yeah. Pons makes you think of certain infections and certain diseases like NMO. Um, ADEM, again, certainly on the list, but areas of the brain that are involved, spinal cord, optic nerve, brain, brainstem, definitely changes the way we think. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, are there any papers or anything we can give therapists to help understand how they should work with, for instance, my mom? We have to, like, convince them that she's worth working, working with, and then they don't really know what to do, so we're telling them, hey, here's the stretches we're doing. Are there anything that can help that and to that fact help insurance understand that my mom's not the same as someone who broke their arm as far as time and duration? So I, I assume you, you refer to physical therapy and occupational therapy yes. afterwards. And this, is a, this is a very good question. I had a couple conversations with some of the audience members the last, the last two days about that um, because there are no official guidelines out there. What we generally uh, try to do is we try to educate the, the community of, of therapists. So um, there's, if you go in literature, there's a ton of uh, case reports, uh, small case series on basically on uh, ABRT, um, so electrical stimulation and in terms of and rehabilitation after following spinal cord injury and transverse myelitis. And uh, we try to disseminate that through the big meetings as well. Um, I'm not aware of any official guideline that's out there, but if we would always be happy if you contact Sanyo, contact us, if you have someone, we'll be happy to uh, connect you with one of our therapists who we're all very willing to help out and, and try to give, give, give advice. Maureen, do you want to comment? Yeah, the other thing I want to mention is, and I, I think he may have mentioned to Kim yesterday uh, this about going to KKI, but the other thing is that, you know, Therapists are wonderful, but they also deal with a lot of different types of injuries, rotator cuffs and hip replacements and all sorts of things. If you can find a therapist that specifically deals or has an interest in spinal cord rehabilitation, it will, because um, I don't know that necessarily everybody has the resources to go to KKI, but even locally, somebody that has an interest in spinal cord rehabilitation, you will get more out of a therapist who uh, deals with spinal cord injury as opposed to somebody who is dealing with so many different process, processes all day. And I'd even take it one step further because I think Maureen's comment is right. And one, this is a bias of mine. I, I think it's much more important to have an interested, motivated, open minded therapist mm -hmm. who's willing to partner with a group than to have the therapist who knows everything. Because the therapist who knows everything, there aren't that many of them. Uh, and so, in Maureen's point of right, we all can't get to KKI. The wonderful thing about their group is they are willing to reach out, get on a phone, email, discuss. We do it on the neurology side. On the Janet does this all the time, and give guidance. And so, um, I would actually prioritize if you're in a community that doesn't have, or, or you're at home and getting home physical therapy. And the home physical therapists are not going to be spinal cord injury experts. That's not what they do. They're wonderful people. That's not what they do. 
if you can find one that's willing to partner up, that is, that is an ideal uh, situation. And Janet, I don't know if that's something you want to comment on, but. Yeah, we, you know, our physical therapists and occupational therapists are always willing to talk with therapists, you know, from outside and, and make suggestions. So I think that's a, that's a really good idea to do. I just, I just want to pipe in here just for a second. We were, we were at a conference um, for uh, botulinum um, out in LA. And I think as a neurologist, sometimes it's hard because I send my patients out for therapy and like, they take one look at them and says, you're too high functioning, you know, go back or, or, or they're just not doing what needs to be done. Um, and I get a nice report, but n nothing basically happened. And I brought up this question while I was at that forum and at the break, this was a lot of physical therapists and occupational therapists, they told me that there is certification okay, for neurology or neurologic conditions, which is much broader than, of course, transverse myelitis, but there is definitely certification for that. It's supposed to be on their website and available. I tell my patients that when they're looking around for something close to home, to ask, is there anybody there who is neuro-certified? Okay, if not, if, could they recommend something close by or somebody close by? And the other thing is, is I think the Multiple Sclerosis Society and Association is, is trying to get a network together um, of therapists that are interested in, in dealing with neurologic diseases. And I think they have resources as well, too, where you're going to find somebody that's a li little bit more um, educated in rehabilitation for this. But I still have problems. I think the other thing is, is that I'm, I always tell my patients I'm perfectly willing to talk to the therapist. Now, I think I've had in all my years, and there have been a few, one therapist that's been willing to, to actually call me and talk to me about what I wanted for my patient. I mean, ideally, I should be calling them. But again, I think that goes with coordination of care. Sometimes I'm spending a lot of time trying to track somebody down, and maybe they're not really interested. And so it is nice if your doctor is networking to try to get a group of people together who they know who can take care of their patients. And, and it's worth noting there, there are bad therapists and physicians out there. I have. It's not framed, but it's on my wall in the office. I refer to patient for therapy, went to a local physician, and this is, I, I promise you, I'll reproduce it, the letter that was written back to me. Dear Dr. Greenberg, I evaluated your patient, Mr. X. There is nothing I can do for him. I have told him not to come back. I cannot help. Signed, and the physician's name. And I realized that said 50,000 times more things about that physician than it does about the patient's condition. Uh, and so, it's, it's kind of the extreme example of somebody who just took a look and said, yep, can't do it, which is not what we need. We need people who are interested in, and willing to try different things. And 